Live from San Jose, California, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data Silicon Valley 2017. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Rick here with theCUBE. We are at Big Data SV in San Jose at the historic Pagoda Lounge. Uh, part of Big Data Week, which is uh, associated with Strata Hadoop, and you know, we've been coming here for eight years, and we're excited to be back. The, the innovation and dynamicism of big data and evolutions now with machine learning and artificial intelligence just continues to roll, and we're really excited uh, to be here talking about one of the nasty aspects of, of this world, unfortunately, malware. So we're excited to have Darren Chinnon. He's the Senior Director of Data Science and Engineering for Malwarebytes. Darren, welcome. Thank you. So for folks that aren't familiar with the company, give us just a little bit of background on Malwarebytes. So Malwarebytes is basically a, a kind of a next generation antivirus software. Uh, we, we started off as uh, humble roots with our, with our founder at 14 years old getting infected with a piece of malware. And um, he reached out into the community and at 14 years old wrote uh, his first, uh, with the help of some people, wrote his first uh, uh, lines of code to remediate a couple of pieces of malware. It grew from there, and by the I think by the ripe old age of 18, founded the company, and uh, he's now I want to say 26 or 27, and uh, uh, we're we're doing quite well. But it was interesting before we went live, you were talking about kind of his philosophy and, and mm -hmm. how important that is to the company, and now it's turned into really a strategic asset yeah. that no one should have to suffer from malware, and he decided to really offer you know, a solution for free to help people rid themselves of this bad software. That's right. Yeah, so Malware, uh, Malwarebytes was founded under, you know, the principle that uh, Marson believes that everyone has the right to a malware-free existence. And so we've always offered a, um, a, a free version of Malwarebytes uh, that will help you to remediate if your machine does get infected with a piece of malware. And that's actually still going to this day. And that's now given you the ability to have a significant amount of endpoint data, uh, right. transactional data, trend data, that now you can bake, at, bake back into the solution. That's right, it's turned into a strategic advantage uh, for the company, it's not something that uh, I don't think that we, that we could have planned at, at, at 18 years old when he was, he was doing this, but um, we've, we've, we've instrumented it so that we can get some anonymous uh, level telemetry and we can understand how malware proliferates. For many, many years, uh, we've been uh, positioned as a second opinion scanner and so um, we're able to see a lot of things, uh, to some trends happening in there and we can actually now see that in real time. So, starting out as a second position scanner, you're, you're basically looking at what, you're, you're finding what others have missed. And, and how can you, wh what do you have to do to become the sort of first line of defense? Well, you know, with the new product, Malwarebytes uh, 3.0, I think that's, uh, some of that landscape is changing. We have, uh, you know, a, a very complete and layered offering. I'm not the product manager, so I, I don't think I, as the uh, data science guy, I don't know if that I'm qualified to, uh, to, to give you the ins and outs, but I think uh, some of that is changing as we have, we've combined a lot of products and we have a much more complete suite of layered uh, protection built into the product. And, and so maybe tell us, without, you know, giving away all the secret sauce, what what sort of platform technologies did you use that enabled you to scale to you know these hundreds of millions of endpoints and then to be fast enough at identifying mm -hmm. trend you know things that were trending that are bad that you had to prioritize right so traditionally um, I think AV companies you know they kind of have like the, these honey pots right where they go and they collect a piece of uh, a, a virus or a piece of malware and they'll take the MD5 hash of that and then they'll basically uh, insert that into sort of a definitions database. And uh, that's a very exact way to do it. The problem is is that there's so much malware or, or viruses uh, out there in the wild, it's impossible to get all of them. I think one of the things that, uh, that, that we did was we set up uh, telemetry and we have a phenomenal research team where we're, under, where we're able to actually um, uh, have our team uh, catch entire families of malware, and that's really the secret sauce to, to, to sort of malware bites. I mean, there's several other levels, but that's where we're sort of helping out uh, in the immediate term. What we do is um, we we have uh, uh, kind of internally we sort of jokingly call it a Lambda two architecture. We had considered Lambda uh, long ago, long ago, and I, and I say about a year ago when we first started this journey. Um, uh, but the, there's 
Lambda is riddled with, you know, as you know, a, a number of issues, right? I mean, um, if if you've ever talked to Jay Kreps from uh, Confluent, uh, you know, uh, he has a lot of opinions on that, right? And uh, one of the key problems with that is that if you do a traditional Lambda, you have to implement your code in two places. It's very difficult. Things get out of sync. You have to have replay frameworks. And uh, these are some of the challenges with Lambda. So uh, we do... Uh, processing um, in a number of areas. The first thing that we did was we implemented Kafka to handle all of the streaming data. We use Kafka Streams uh, to, to do sort of inline uh, stateless transformations. And then we also use Kafka Connect. And uh, we write all of our data uh, both into uh, HBase. We use that. We may swap that out later for something like Redis. Um, and that would be sort of a, a thin speed layer. And then we also uh, move the data into S3, and we use uh, some ephemeral clusters to do very large-scale batch processing. And that really provides our data lab. Is, and when you call that sort of Lambda 2, is that because you're still working essentially on two different infrastructures, so your code isn't quite the same? You still have to sort of check the results on either sort of, on That's either right. fork. That's right, yeah. We, we didn't feel like it was, uh, we did evaluate doing everything in the stream, um, uh, but there are, certain, uh, there, there are certain operations that are difficult to do with purely stream processing. And so we did need a little bit, uh, we did ha need to have uh, kind of a thin, uh, what we call real-time indi indicators uh, speed layer to sort of supplement what we were doing in the stream. And so, so, and so that's kind of the differentiating factor between a traditional Lambda architecture where you'd want to have everything in the stream and everything in batch, and the batch is really more of a truing mechanism as opposed to um, our real time is really directional. So, so in the traditional sense, if you look at uh, um, traditional business intelligence, you, you'd have KPIs that would allow you to gauge the health of your business. We have sort of RTIs, real-time indicators, that allow us to gauge really directionally what is important to look at this day, this hour, this minute. Oh, this thing is burning up the charts. Exactly. Therefore, it's priority one. That's right. You got it. Okay. And, and maybe tell us a little more, um, because everyone, I'm sure, is familiar with Kafka, but the Streams product from them is a little newer, as is Kafka Connect. So it it's, sounds like you know, you've got it's not just the transport, but you've got some basic analytics, and you've got the ability to do the ETL because you've got you know connect that comes from you know sources and destinations, sources and sinks. Right. Tell us how 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 you use that. Well, the streams product is ju it's it's quite different than you know something like um, Spark streaming, right? I mean, it's not working off micro batching; it's it's actually working off the stream. And the second thing is, it's not a separate cluster. It's it's just a, a library, effectively a jar file, right? And so, um, uh, because it works natively with Kafka, um, it handles certain things like quite well, right? Like it handles back pressure, and when you you know when you expand the cluster, it's pretty good with things like that. We've um, found it to be you know a fairly stable technology. Um, it's just a library, and and uh, we've worked very closely with Confluent to to, to develop that. Um, Whereas Kafka Connect is really something that we use to write out to S3. In fact, Confluent um, just uh, released a new, uh, like an, an S3 connector uh, direct. Uh, we were using StreamX, which is sort of a wrapper on top of uh, an HDFS connector, and they kind of rigged that up to write down it right, right to S3 for us. So um, maybe tell us, you know, when, if you, as you look out, what, what sorts of technology do technologies do you see as you know in enabling you to build a platform that's richer um, and then sort of how would that show up in the functionality cus consumers like we would see um, with respect to the architecture yeah well one of the things that we we had to do is we had to um, evaluate where we wanted to spend our time right we're a very small team the entire data science and engineering team um, is less than I think 10 months old. So all of us got hired, wow. we've stood up this platform, we've gone very, wow. very fast. And um, we had to decide, uh, how are we gonna A, get, you know, we've made this big investment, how are we gonna get value to our end customer quickly so that they're not waiting around and you get, you know, the traditional big data story where, you know, we spent all this money and now we're not getting anything out of it. Um, 
And, and so we had to make some of those strategic decisions. And, and, and because of the fact that the data was, you know, really truly big data in nature, there's just a huge amount of work that has to be done in these open source technologies. They're not baked, it's not like going out to Oracle and giving them a purchase order and you install it and away you go. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work. And so um, we, we've sort of made some strategic decisions on what we're going to do in open source and what we're going to do with sort of a third party vendor solution. And one of those solutions uh, that we decided was workload automation. So um, uh, I just did a talk on this about how Control-M from BMC was really the tool that we chose uh, to, to handle a lot of the coordination, the sophisticated coordination and the workload automation um, on the batch side. And we're about to implement that um, in a, sort of a data quality monitoring framework. And uh, that's turned out to be an incredibly stable solution for us. Um, it's allowed us to not spend time with open source solutions that do the same things like Airflow, which may or may not work well, but you know there's really no support around that, and, and focus our efforts on what we believe to be the really, really hard problems to tackle in Kafka, Kafka Streams, Connect, et cetera. Um, is it f fair to say that um, Kafka plus Kafka Connect solves many of the old ETL problems, or do you still need some sort of orchestration tool on top of it to completely commoditize, you know, essentially moving and transforming data from, I guess, a you know, OLTP or operational mm -hmm. system to a decision support system? I, I, I guess the answer to that is uh, it depends on your use case. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things that, that, that Kafka and, and uh, the streams jo job can, can solve for you, but um, I don't think that we're at the point where, where everything can be streaming. Right, um, uh, I think that's that's a ways off. There's legacy systems that really don't na natively stream to you anyway, um, and there's just certain operations that are just more efficient to do in batch, and so that's why we've. I don't think batch for us is going away uh, anytime soon, um, and that's one of the reasons why workload automation I in the bachelor initially was so important, and we've. Uh, decided to extend that actually into sort of building out a data quality monitoring framework to sort of uh, put a collar around uh, how how accurate our data is on the real real time side. Because it's really horses for courses. It's not one or the other. It's kind of application specific. What's the best solution for that particular? Yeah, I don't. Reason? I don't think that there's a, a. If there was a one size fits all, it'd be a company, and there wouldn't be no need for architects. So I think that. Uh, I think that, that uh, you have to look at your use case, your company, what kind of data, what style of data, what type of analysis do you need? Do you really actually need the data in real time? And if you do put in all the work to get it in real time, um, you know, are you going to be able to take action on it? And I think uh, Malwarebytes was a great candidate when it came in. I said, well, it, it does look like uh, we can justify the need for real time data and the effort that goes into to, to, to building out a real time framework. Right. Right, and as we always say, what is real time, right? In time to do something about it. And if it's, not, <laughs> if it's not time to do something about it, depending on how you right, define real right. time, what really, what, what, what difference right. does it make if you can't do anything about it that's right. that fast, you know? That's um, right. So as you look out in the future with IoT, um, all these connected devices, this hugely increased attack surface as we just were at RSA a few yeah. weeks back. How does that you know, work into your planning what do you guys think about kind of the future where there's so many more connected devices out on the edge and various degrees of in intelligence and opportunities to, to hijack, if you will? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I, I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to speak about the Malwarebytes <laughs> product roadmap uh, as far as IoT goes. But more but philosophically, you know, yeah. from, from a professional point of view, because it's, mm -hmm. a, you know, it's, Every coin has two sides. A lot of That's good right. stuff coming from IoT and connected devices, right. but uh, you know, as we keep hearing over and over, just this massive That's attack right. surface expansion. Well, I think that f for us, the key is is you know we're small and we're not operating. You know, like I came from Apple, where we operated on a budget of infinity. Uh, so we we not uh, not we're, the building we're not infinity or the address okay. infinity. <laughs> That's right. yeah. The actual budget. Uh, we're small, and we have to make sure that whatever we do creates value. And so what I'm seeing in the future is, is as we get more into the IoT space and logs you know, begin to proliferate and data, just, it just exponentiates in size, it's, it's really how do we do the same thing and how, how are we going to manage that right, in terms of costs. 
um, generally big data is very low in information density, right? I mean, it's not like transactional systems where you get the data, it's effectively an Excel spreadsheet and you can go run some, some pivot tables and filters and away you go. Um, I think big data in general requires a tremendous amount of massaging to get to the point where a data scientist or an analyst can actually extract some insight and some value. And the question is, how do you, how do you massage that data in a way that's going to be cost effective as IoT you know, expands and proliferates? So that's sort of the question that we're dealing with. We're uh, at this point all in with cloud technologies. We're leveraging uh, quite a few of Amazon services, uh, serverless technologies as well. Um, we just uh, are in the process of moving to the Athena, right, to Athena um, um, as a, just an on-demand query service. And um, we, we use a lot of ephemeral clusters as well, and that allows us to actually run all of our ETL in about two hours. Um, and so this is, these are some of the things that we're doing to sort of prepare for this explosion of data and making sure that we're in a position where um, we're not uh, spending a dollar to gain a penny. Right, if right. that makes sense. Yeah, right. that's his business. Well, he makes fun of that <laughs> business model. <laughs> I <laughs> can, you could do it, right? You want to drive revenue, sell dollars for 90 cents and watch <laughs> it run. Oh, that's a dot um, com model. Right? <laughs> exactly. I was there. All right, and make it up in volume. All right, Daryl Chen, thanks for uh, taking a few minutes out of your day and, and uh, giving us a story on Melbourne Bite. It sounds pretty exciting and a great opportunity. Thanks, I enjoyed it. Absolutely. He's Darren, I'm, he's George, I'm Jeff. You're watching The Cube. We're at Big Data SV at the Historic Pagoda Lounge. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back after this short break. Thank you.